Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we just acknowledge your presence here. <laughs> there is a name that is above every other name. And it's at that name that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And Father, as we're here tonight, Lord, we just set the atmosphere here. And we declare that Jesus is Lord over every circumstance, over all torment, anguish, sickness, disease, lack. <laughs> we declare that it must bow to the name of Jesus. Strife, injustice, <laughs> and every secret thing, Father, that only you know. I speak Jesus. Jesus. Father, even Jeremiah said, if I couldn't say your name, it would be like fire shut up in my bones. Oh, Father, thank you for the revelation of Jesus. And Father, I thank you that tonight, <laughs> Lord, your light just permeates here. It exposes every lie. And it reveals even those things, Father, that we've just, we've been asking you about. So, Lord, I just thank you for answers tonight. And I ask you, Lord, to use me and speak through me and think through me so that all would be encouraged and strengthened and edified by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Ooh, you know, ever since we, we Pastor Aaron, when actually we were over on our anniversary, he had been playing that song. And, you know, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger on the inside of us. And, and, I was studying that place where Jeremiah had said, Lord, even, and it was out of fear, you know, when he said that. And he was, Lord, even if I couldn't say your name, it still would be like fire shut up in my bones. And when you come to the place of the revelation of just who Jesus is, I can see how he would say that. Even if I was pushed to the place where I couldn't say your name, I couldn't help but say your name because it would be like fire shut up in my bones. Glory to God. Glory to God. Jesus. That's what this world needs. Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Well, I'm excited about what the Lord has tonight. I'm just um, going to follow him. Praise God. There is just few different things on my heart. I'm still going to continue to, 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 to talk about the discernment for this hour. It's important, again, so that we are not, we do not become muddied by the spirit of this age. Um, we talked about what discernment is. It's a right way of judging things. The importance of that. Um, our foundational verse has been in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. We've, we've dissected that verse. Um, again, I would encourage you that if, you have, if you've missed some of the teachings to go back um, and listen to those. Um, that verse is, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits. We talked about what that is. Doctrines of devils, we talked about what that is. Speaking lies in hypocrisy and having their conscience seared with a hot iron, we talked about what that means. 
when you get to a place where your conscience is seared like a hot iron. And that departing from the faith is it's, it's a moving away from the Bible. It's not a rejecting, but it's like a modification, a slowly moving away from the truth. And we can see that that's what our society is doing. And so we looked at Jude and how Jude was saying, he was exhorting believers and he was saying, you know, you are called of God, you are loved of God, and you are kept by God for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden, his language begins to shift. And he says, but I will tell you, contend for the faith. You need to contend. And I looked it up in the message. Um, If we could put the message up in Jude 3, I thought this was so good. Um, Let's see, is that, okay, so that's, it says, dear friends, I've dropped everything to write about this life of salvation that we have in common. I have to write insisting, begging, that you fight with everything you have in you for this faith entrusted to us as a gift to guard and to cherish. Oh, isn't it so good? Jesus, such a gift, such a gift for us to hold and to cherish, right? And he's, I mean, he's literally, so he's exhorting them. He's exhorting them, and all of that is, 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 is love exhortation to us, but then he gets to the place where he's telling us the importance because there are those that had come in and were trying to, to uh, pull people away from the truth, right? And so it, that, that's what we're seeing, glory to God. And so I'm exhorting you, we need to contend for the faith, right? Hallelujah, glory to God, praise you, Jesus. Begging that you fight with everything you have in you for this faith entrusted to us. Think about that entrusted to us you know all right lord we go there's in thessalonians do you remember that i had said because the last time that we met we we had just uh began to remove our troops from afghanistan right and and i said you know there's a reason why there could be peace in the country of Afghanistan while we were there, or, 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 you know, a certain level of peace, I'll say that, right? Because we were there, right? Our troops were there. And I said, in Ephesians chapter 6, we see the hierarchy of Satan. And the first thing is principalities and powers. And those are demonic spirits that rule over governments, over countries, over regions. And so that's why... You can send our troops in and we'll have a certain level of peace and then you remove our troops and that spirit, right, has nothing to hold it back. Well, you know that's what 2 Thessalonians, right? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, right? Not verse 12, uh, let's see. Let me find it because this was just, yep, verse 7. 2, 7 and it says... For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. See, iniquity is at work. It's been at work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Glory to God. See, we are the holding back factor. (laughs) There is a holding back, but when we leave, see, there's two things that we're waiting on, right? And, and one is when we meet Jesus in the air, right, at his appearance, which a lot of people call the rapture, right? And so <laughs> that's approaching. It's rapidly approaching, glory to God, the rapture of the church. And the other is the second coming of the Lord. Now, the one we meet him in the air, the second is when he comes and he puts his foot down on the Mount of Olives, and that is going to be the climax of the ages when we'll begin to see the battles take place and it'll lead to the marriage supper, glory to God, um, but that we'll see the battle of Armageddon and all that's going to take place, right, in that time. Um, I was reading, glory to God, again, the Lord just has a few different things um, on my heart with this because there's a, a place in Scripture where it says, be comforted by these words. It's also in Thessalonians, right? 
Yeah, wherefore comfort thee. If you look at, and I apologize, Paul, I didn't give you these, but I was just, this just came to me in prayer before I, I, I came out here. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 15, basically, and it says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. So this isn't something I've said. This, isn't, this, this, is, this is from the Lord. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now that's talking about those who have gone before us, those, those who have gone on to glory, right? Even though they've gone on to glory, they're not gonna miss this event. <laughs> they're not gonna miss this event. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. They're gonna get their glorified bodies, hallelujah. Then ye which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. And then verse 18, he says, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. You know, we are seeing in this hour right now, a lot of people going home to glory. I know that people have been impacted in this hour um, and, and have had um, the going home of a loved one, right? But take comfort in these words. Take comfort in these words because we will meet them again in the air. And they're not going to miss this coming of the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And, and we are to be looking for this blessed hope. That's what the Bible tells us is that we are to be look There's things when you study scripture, there are things that the Lord reveals to us that we should be thinking on. And there are things that the Lord reveals to us that we should not be thinking on. Right? And spiritual strength is a product of what you meditate. Spiritual strength is a product of what you meditate, right? Behavior and its intensity is birthed by thought. And I've said this before, if I think about chocolate ice cream long enough, I'm gonna go get some chocolate ice cream, right? Because behavior and its intensity is birthed by thought. Well, it's the same with our spiritual strength. Right? The Bible says that yet the outward man perishes, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Glory to God. And see, it's like your spirit has a certain immune system, right? And weakened, it becomes susceptible to everything, right? But strong, it fights off everything. Glory to God. And so that's important. Remember, because I said there's a training, right? And we talked about that. We had one of our teachings was the training of our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions, because our spirit is good. It's our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions that need the training, glory to God, right? Romans 12, 2, pastor talked about it yesterday. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? So being born again is one thing, right? Because what uh, Colossians 1.13 says, when you are born again, the moment you are born again, you are now translated into the kingdom of God's dear son, right? And as pastor has been teaching us about the kingdom, right? The kingdom of God is God's way of doing and being right, right? The kingdom of heaven is one thing, but the kingdom of God, right, is the realm and the domain of God. It's the way he does what he does. And so there's a transforming of our thinking because as we, as we are born in this world, right, that's why Romans 12, 2 says in the Amplified, right, don't be conformed, fashioned after or adapted to its superficial customs, right? Because that's what happens to, to in, in the world, right? Because what happens is your, your family, your, your circumstances, your environment try to condition you, right? That's what happens. And so in that conditioning, right, the Lord says, <laughs> don't be conditioned, right, after the rudiments of this world, but allow me to transform, right, the way you think, glory to God. I mean, that, okay, so that's why God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments. It wasn't a, ah, you cannot, you shall not, you will not, you won't, 
right? That was not at all about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments was that God was trying to... Re- See, they had been used to, for 400 years, they had been used to, be, to doing everything for themselves, enslaved, in bondage, right? And this world tries to get us in bondage to all kinds of different things, right? Wrong relationships, right? Um, seeking after money, seeking after all these other things the world tries to condition us to. But when the... And so... The Lord comes to the Israelites and said, I'm your God. I'm your God. There is one God, and I want to be, you are my people. I am your God, and you are my people, right? So he's trying to reveal to them, I want to be, allow me to be you, your God. See, God never created you to be the Lord of your life. See, as we're speaking and we're singing about Jesus, <laughs> glory to God, Jesus, Jesus as Lord, The way that Jesus is Lord of our life is when we bring our ideals, our attitudes, our thinking into alignment with his. See, because when we don't, then we make the decision to be the Lord of our own life. And and, and guess what? You're not strong enough to do that. He didn't didn't create you to to bear the weight of, of, of everything in this world. Glory to God. And so when he brought the Ten Commandments to them, he was revealing to them, you know, don't steal. You don't have to steal. I'm going to provide for you, right? Don't covet. You don't have to worry about what your neighbor has. I'll get you better, right? This is the heart of God. And when you look at that, see, people look at it through the eyes of religion, right? Instead of in light of who God is. God is love. And when you look into Scripture, right, make sure you're interpreting it through the eyes of love, because God is love, glory to God. And so when he was bringing that to them, right, he, he was trying to reveal to them who he was. Jesus, when Jesus came into the earth, you got to think about this. When Jesus came into the earth, he shined this big, bright light into the earth, revealing that we had an enemy. Because up until that point that Jesus came, they didn't know. They thought, in the Old Testament, they thought everything good that happened was from God and everything bad that happened was from God. And when you study the, he- the, the, the Hebrew, there is, um, you got to look at the language there because there's no permissive language in the Hebrew. And so many of the things that are written in Old Testament, people look at God as harsh and hard, and, but there's no permissive language in the Hebrew. And so many things that people think were God is not God, glory to God, I mean, even when you look at Job, you can, you can read in Job, and it literally says in Job, and it was Satan that smote Job with the boils. I mean, you can look at, the scripture is so clear. Remember the woman, there was a woman, right, that uh, had the issue of blood um, for 18 years or 12 years, and then there was another woman with 18 years. And when Jesus came to that woman, it literally says, when he is confronted by the Sadducees, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he's literally having to tell them, you know, isn't it appropriate for this woman whom Satan has bound, says it there, whom Satan has bound to be loosed? Glory to God. Hallelujah. And so scripture is very clear. John 10.10 10 was the revelation that Jesus brought. Glory to God. There is a thief and he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you now may have life and that life more abundantly. Glory to God. Glory to God. In Acts chapter 1, remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? And Jesus, right? When Jesus is going to be glorified and and, and go to heaven, correct? And sit at the right hand of God. The angel literally says, right? What are you looking for? In the same way that you saw him go, you will see him come. And it literally says there, I'm just going, I got to... Go to scripture because I want you all to see it. Go ahead to Acts. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Verse, um, let me see where we want us to go to. Eight, we'll start in eight. Eight, Eight to 11. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be my witnesses. 
both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Glory to God. And when he had spoken, this was Jesus, when Jesus had said these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. <laughs> I, love I love it. Which also said, you men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Amen. This same Jesus. Now, if he was one way on the earth, and he's going to be the same when he comes back, well, wouldn't you say he's the same now? Yes. Glory to God. And Hebrews said he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is still healing, delivering. Glory to God bringing freedom, hallelujah, glory to God. This same Jesus, glory to God. I mean, you just, the truth is he's the same right now, right, as he was when he walked on the earth. He has the same heart of compassion. He is just as easily moved now as he was then. He's just as quick to heal now as he ever was. He truly is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But see, the problem comes when we start reasoning in our mind where our situations are concerned, our circumstances or our troubles are concerned, right? Well, this disease, I've had it for so long, and, you know, really, they've said it's incurable, right? I mean, this is where the mind goes, beginning to reason away the truth of who Jesus is. Hallelujah. I was just ministering to someone on Sunday, and in the message translation, literally, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 17 says, as for you, and this is for somebody, as for you, I have already come and cured the incurable. Amen. Now, you got to think about that, because that was 800 years before Jesus came, and he was looking ahead prophetically, and he was seeing Jesus and the Father was revealing that to Isaiah, and he was saying, there is nothing incurable with Jesus. As for you, I've already come and cured the incurable. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And that might even be, that includes everything. Dis-ease, dis-ease. Anything that brings dis-ease, it can be physically, mentally, emotionally. And maybe you've been under the weight of that mental torment, whatever that is, for so long and bore the weight of that. And the Lord wants to say, as for you, that's a small thing. I've already come and taken care of it through my son Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Allow Jesus to be Lord over that. See, there's things that we, see, the Bible says that he will perfect that, right? He will perfect that thing which you commit to him. He'll perfect it. That which you commit to him, he'll perfect it. The problem is we have trouble with commitment. <laughs> because we want to give it to him and then we take it back and then we give it to him and then we take it back and then we give it to him and we take it back, right? Right? But if we want to allow him to perfect that situation, then we've got to make a decision by faith to settle it and say, no, Lord. And if it's you, whatever it is that's going to mark your spirit with it, if it's you coming down at the altar and saying, you know what? That's it. That's it, Lord. I don't want this anymore. You didn't create me to bear this. I give it to you once and for all. I lay it at this altar 
And you said that you would perfect those things which concern me. This thing has been a concern on me. It's weighed me down. It's tried to overcome me. But I declare Jesus. Jesus is Lord. Jesus. And so, Lord, I thank you that you're going to perfect this thing. You're going to perfect this thing. As for me, you already brought the provision. You already came and took care of it. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So he's just as moved with compassion today as he ever was. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. In the New Testament, Jesus came on the scene to let us know the truth about God and the devil. And it was a revelation that he exposed who the devil was teaching John 10.10. 10. And he was saying, there is a devil roaming the earth and he's trying to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he's bad, and he wants to take your life, but I'm good, and I want to give you life. I even want to give you my life. Give my life for you. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Jesus never touched people and gave them a disease. He touched them and healed them and removed their disease. Jesus, did never, Jesus never killed one baby. He begged the children to come unto him. Glory to God. He calmed storms. He walked on water. He healed people. He cast out demons. He multiplied food to feed people. He was a good shepherd, and he went to the cross so that you could experience an abundant life. Praise God. The stealing, killing, and destroying that happen in life comes from only one source, and that is the devil. And Jesus gave us the knowledge of our enemy, which we desperately needed. And most of all, he gave us the power to destroy all the work of the enemy when he went to the cross. 1 Corinthians 2, 8, right? Had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. <laughs> See, Satan could not comprehend that love. He couldn't comprehend that kind of love, Right? Had he known, he wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. See, that's the place where the world tries to conform us. See, the world's kind of love, the world's idea of love, right? The world's idea of love is you do for me and I'll do for you. You don't do for me and I won't do for you. But God's love is I love you irregardless of what you do. You've got to think about this love of God because at man's biggest failure, when man rejected the truth of God's word, right, in the garden and committed high treason, it was at that place, right, where sin and death came into the world. And the Bible says held man bondage, held man captive. I mean, literally, God had a kidnap ransom situation on his hands. Man was held captive by sin and death, literally saying, if you want to see your man again, pay the price. And God paid the price. Through Jesus, he destroyed him, Hebrews said, who had the power of death. See, death has no power. Death holds no power over you. Jesus said there is no sting of death. See, when you cross over, glory to God. <laughs> That's what, this, what, just what you do. You just step, step right into glory. There's no sting to death. For those that don't know Jesus, there's a sting to death. There's eternal torment why it's so, so important. I think is it 2 Corinthians 2.14 that says he has made us to triumph. And it, there's a translation that says in that triumph is a sweet fragrance of the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Let me see if I can find that for you. That was really ministering to me. Because I'm telling you, as you walk in the revelation of who Jesus is, <laughs> okay, this is going to sound really stupid, 
but you smell good. Like there's a fragrance, like, like it's just good. It oozes, right? Just oozes from you, the goodness of God. Now thanks, this is it, it's a new king, new king, I was right, hey, 2 Corinthians 2.14. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. <laughs> I love that. It means everywhere we go, right? As we walk in the revelation of who Jesus is, hallelujah, we're just smelling good everywhere we go. We're just smelling good, right? Glory, the stinkiest place we can walk into, glory to God, and change the atmosphere of that place just by who's in us. Glory to God, hallelujah, hallelujah. All right, I'm just gonna read this to you. I want you to, I want you to be blessed by it, praise God. What is God's will for you according to this scripture? To triumph, to win. How often? This verse says always. Now, I'm just gonna encourage you. This is from Marilyn Hickey, glory to God. This has blessed me. She has a whole study teaching seeing Jesus. And when you study scripture, we see Jesus all through the Bible. He's everywhere, he's everywhere. He's every book, every page, he's everywhere, glory to God. Um, says this verse says always. Friend, this is so important for us. God doesn't want us to win one thing. God wants us to win all things, always. We must keep thinking, God wants me to win this. That's so good. Keep that on your mind. We must keep thinking, God wants me to win this. <laughs> God wants me to prevail in this. God wants this to happen. Stay in that winning attitude. There can be a lot of negative things around you, but you can choose to stay in a winning attitude. Hallelujah. You can choose to stay in a winning attitude. Because what happens is the circumstances of life happen, right? And that thing that normally would produce courage in you begins to draw that courage from you, right? Remember at the ladies' event, I taught about that leaky bucket, right? It's like that bucket that has the holes in it, right? And what hap begins to happen is, is courage just begins to leak and leak and leak, right? Until you get to the place where you're dis Encouraged. You lack courage. It's exactly the place the enemy wants to take you. I heard Billy Brim share something that, uh, and I wrote it down because I thought, ooh, that's good. It's ouch. And so I'm not going to say this to offend anyone because, listen, <laughs> if you live in this world, every one of us in this room has gone through stuff. There's not one person in this room, I'm sure, that I can't talk to that could share just stuff, right? And so this is what she said about depression. She said, depression is just not acceptable. Ouch. It's just not acceptable. Depression is thinking only of yourself all the time. Ouch. That's what I said. Pastor Lice say, ouch or amen. It's, it's amen for sure, but it's ouch, right? It's thinking of yourself all the time, and thinking of yourself all the time would depress anyone, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. So take courage. Take courage. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus taught a principle where this is concerned in Matthew chapter 6, right? Because I said spiritual strength is a product of what you meditate. And so Jesus was sharing this principle in Matthew chapter 6. Actually, I want to look at the Amplified in it, Paul, if you don't mind. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 in the Amplified. I have the King James. I don't have the Amplified with me. Yep, perfect. Therefore, I tell you, stop being perpetually uneasy, anxious and worried about your life, what you shall eat and what you shall drink or about your body, what you shall put on. Is not life greater in quality than food and the body far above and more excellent than clothing, right? Literally has to say perpetually uneasy. Stop being perpetually uneasy, right? 
What happens perpetually is it means you, you, that's where your meditation is. That's what you keep thinking on. You keep thinking. I mean, the more you, right? The more you look at something, more, the more you stare at a problem, the more magnified it gets, right? That's why we look up. Do you remember in Genesis chapter 13 where Lot, right, is it basically pitched his tent in front of Sodom? right? And there was strife with their herdsmen. And so Abraham was not going to have the strife. So literally he said, you know, listen, Lot, you just, you pick whatever you want. You just, you pick the place, you know, the land that you want, right? And really it was heartbreaking to Abraham when you think about it, because that was his only real family, right? I mean, yes, he was married and yes, he had a lot of servants and all these things, but his only, that was his nephew, right? Because he didn't have a lineage yet at this time, right? And so he didn't have Isaac, didn't have Ishmael. And so the Lord tells him, Abraham, so Lot's chosen it, right? And then he goes and he tells Abraham, Abraham, look up and look from. And I believe he had to tell Abraham, look up, because I believe Abraham was dealing with discouragement. Because he wanted to be with Lot, right? Like he, he was a family guy. He wanted family. And so for him, I believe, so, but the Lord was telling him, look up. Stop looking down and around and see that's what the, de- the devil tries to do is just get us like this, right? And just looking at our problem, right? And God literally says, Abraham, look up. Look up. Stop looking down. Look up and look from the place that you are. And you know what? For every one of us, if there's something that you've been dealing with and it's tried to grab your attention and get you to so focus on it, looking at it, looking at it, looking at it, worried about it, anxious about it, even to the point of depression, right? Or to even, even, even shame, even shame. Because that's what happens with people's past. They never make the decision to look up and look from their past. And their past tries to hold them captive. And so they live all their life in light of their past. And then let me just set you free tonight. God is bigger than your mistakes. God is bigger than your mistakes and he can redeem any situation, any life, any circumstance. He can redeem it. He's the great redeemer. And so there's a place where you have to make a decision. I'm going to look up from this thing and look from. Because my life isn't back here. My life is up here. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Look up and look from, he told him. Well, so Jesus is talking about this principle, right? And he's saying, do not be perpetually uneasy. But then he goes on to say, verse 27, he talks about who by worrying, right? And who, who of you by worrying and being anxious can add one unit of measure to your statue? Worrying doesn't change anything. But when you make a decision to give it to the one who can change it, that's when change can happen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Who by worrying, right, can add one cubit? Then he goes, verse 28. Why should you be anxious, right? And why should you be anxious about your clothes, right? Consider the lilies of the field and learn thoroughly how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Glory to God. Um, Then let's go to verse 31. Because these are all the places where he's saying what you meditate. Remember I said spiritual strength is, is produced by what you meditate, right? It's a product of what you meditate. Hallelujah. Verse 3, therefore do not worry and be anxious, saying. Now do you see the escalation of that? Do you see where that goes? Because he's like, don't be worried, don't be anxious, don't be worried, don't be anxious. And then he says, saying. Because what happens is you mentally 
go round and round and round that problem and the enemy keeps you there, then you start talking it. Then you're saying it. And you're saying it. And you're saying it. Right? And we know that 103rd Psalm, right? Is it Psalms or Proverbs? 103rd Psalm, right? It says the angels hearken to the voice of his word to perform it. The angels hearken to the voice of his word to perform it. So there's something you should be saying, but it's not the anxious thought, glory to God. So remember, Jesus is telling us a principle here. And then 33, he tells us, remember I said the Bible is very clear about there are things we should think on and there are things we should not think on. Well, he's telling us, think this first. Think this first. Therefore, but seek, aim at, and strive after first his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, and then all these things taken together will be given you besides. Hallelujah. First, be kingdom-minded first. Go to him first. See, we want to go to our friends first. We want to go to our minds first, right? And we want to toil over it and toil over it. And he says, no, do this first. Go to the kingdom first. So let's just take that into practical application. I mean, there's practical application all over the Bible with, with, with circumstances that we're faced with, right? Let's say you're faced with a circumstance of fear, and the first thing that wants to come to you is fear over that thing. And remember, I taught you guys those, the three things, right, when, when the Israelites were right, poised at the Red Sea, no place to go, right? seemingly hopeless situation, the first thing, right, that Moses tells them is fear not. Fear not, right? Fear not. Stand your ground, right? Hold your peace. Fear not. Be still. Hold your peace. To me, that's such practical application for (laughs) so many things we face in life. Because we get the report, we hear the situation, we see the checkbook, we see the bill, we see the diagnosis, whatever. And what happens is the enemy comes immediately and brings fear. But the moment you choose to, decide, to make the decision to yield, remember pastor's been teaching us, there's things we yield to and there's things we don't yield to. But the moment you decide to yield to that fear is the moment that you, because what fear does is get you to move independent of God. And you've got to remind yourself of that because the moment you choose to yield to fear, you now have said, I got this. I'm going to go ahead and make a decision or move independent of you, Lord, and I'm going to let fear make my choice. I mean, that's why people marry certain people that's why, and make a wrong choice. That's why people take certain jobs and it's the wrong job. It's why people move to certain cities and it's the wrong city. It's why people leave churches and they, they, it's where they should have stayed planted. On and on and on and on, the enemy wants us to yield to fear by taking the worried and the anxious thought, right? But yet I said spiritual strength, right, is produced by what you meditate. It's a product of what you're meditating on. And so the moment that that happens in us, we have a choice. That's right, Lord. (laughs) I'm going to seek your kingdom first. And what you've told me to do is, first of all, don't fear. Secondly, right, you've told me to stand still. Because literally in that verse where it says, if you stand still, you'll see the salvation of the Lord. He will work for you this day. Glory to God. See, when we choose to be still, he goes to work. But if we are working, we tie his hands, right? Because we've chosen to be Lord of it. Hallelujah. So don't fear. Be still, right? And hold your peace. That's a big one. Hold your peace. To me, that's twofold. It's not just maintaining the peace that we have in him, right? Because Philippians 4 literally says, right? Think on da 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 right? And then the peace of God, if you think on whatsoever things are good and just and pure and lovely and of good report, right? If you think on these things, it literally tells us there that the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. So there is a guard that God has given us to station 
that's stationed over our heart and our mind, and it literally is the peace of God. But what happens is we choose to make a decision independent of God and meditate that anxious thought perpetually, right? And we just tell the guard, you know, see you later, peace. Just at the moment that we need it stationed over our mind and our heart, glory to God. And so I think that is twofold. It is maintaining and staying in the peace of God, and then it's holding your peace, right? Because you've heard people say, right, they're in an altercation or whatever, and you'll tell somebody, just hold your peace. Hold your peace, because we are so tempted to say something. When we're squeezed by our emotions, by those challenges, right? When we're squeezed like that, we are so tempted to say something. And so this is what he's saying. Wait a minute, do this first. The anxious thought's gonna come, the challenge is gonna come, the circumstance is gonna come, but Jesus is giving us a principle here and he's telling us spiritual strength, right, is produced by what you meditate. And if you would stop perpetually being anxious over all of these things and do this first, go here first, glory to God, hallelujah, praise God. It says, then all these things, all these things, what? That you're perpetually anxious about will be added unto you. I love how it says added unto you. Doesn't say that you went and got it. Doesn't say added to you. So it didn't come by toil, didn't come by anything that you did other than seeking his kingdom first, going to him first. Again, go back to the Israelites. That's what he was trying to tell them. Hey guys, listen, I know for 400 years you've been enslaved and in bondage and used to doing for yourself and working hard and living in fear and all these, but hey, listen, I've come and you're my people and I'm your God. And I want to take care of you. You don't have to steal. You don't have to kill. See, you're not your protector. I'm your protector. Glory to God. You don't have to fend for yourself. Glory to God. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Now, what's interesting is when you study Scripture, judgment is one thing, vengeance is another. Judgment is one thing, and so many times that's what we see. You know, let's say that uh, someone has, maybe a drunk driver has killed your loved one, right? And judgment or justice in this earth is, you know, either they're sentenced to death or they're sentenced to, you know, life in prison or whatever, and that's, that's justice, but it's not vengeance. You know what? Vengeance is Paul's road to Damascus experience. That's, that's the place which, okay, I'm like going, you got to stay with me here with, with, with what I'm saying. See, God takes it to another place. Like it, and that's where he's saying you, you, you got to transform your mind because the best justice is God's vengeance And with Paul, even when Paul stoned Stephen, now the Bible said Stephen didn't even see, I believe Stephen had stepped over already. I believe God had him. But the vengeance of God is now Paul, is he wrote, what, two-thirds of the New Testament. He gave Paul the greatest revelation that we have in the New Testament, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so there's some things where we want to see justice in our life. We want to see justice done. We want to, but you know what? All the more is God's vengeance. And he says, I'll repay. Vengeance is, you don't have to worry about that thing that happened to you, whatever it is. (laughs) You just give it to me. You seek me first. You let it go and you seek me. And not only will justice happen, but vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And I will do something that you couldn't even fathom for you. I'll take care of it. Glory to God. Glory to God. It's the goodness of God. He's so good. 
He's so good. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Um, I have something. I have more in my notes, but I believe I want us to see this. Rick Renner, because there's something in this that I want you guys to see. Um, so, Paul, we are going to play that video, um, but I want to, let me just, let me say this. Let me set this up for you. Okay, he is, okay, we're in a season where people call it Halloween, okay? I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes because I believe that you need to walk in the revelation that you have. We do not celebrate Halloween. I do believe it's evil, an evil holiday, but I'm not gonna go there. I want you, you know, the, the Bible literally tells us to avoid all appearance of evil. Some people think it's, you know, um, innocent and different things like that. And I'm, I, again, you walk in the revelation that you have with it. And so he is going to talk a little bit about that, but that's not, that's not my focus in what he's sharing. He brings out something in John 10:10 10, 10 that I think is so beneficial for every one of us to recognize and realize because he literally teaches Remember, I, I brought out John 10.10, 10, and when Jesus came into the earth, he brought revelation of John 10.10, 10, that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He explains what each one of those are, and I'm telling you, if you get the revelation of this, it will give you knowledge of your enemy, I believe, in certain areas of your life. So I'd like us to watch this. Not but to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I'd come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. This first is just... No, no worries. Today, we're going to be discussing, is the devil funny? You know, when I was a little boy, I dressed up like the devil on Halloween with my sisters, okay. who dressed up like spooks and witches, and together we'd get our big brown paper sack, and we'd be walk up and down the streets in our neighborhood on our side of Tulsa. We'd knock on doors, we'd say trick or treat, of course, people would give us candy, but the streets were just loaded with kids dressed like us. It looked like the streets were loaded with little goblins and devils and demons and witches and Frankenstein and vampires. I mean, we really done horrific looking costumes and played it up on Halloween. And not just that, but in the week before Halloween, my precious mother, who led me to Jesus and is a very committed Christian, would give me construction paper. So I could draw pictures of witches and ghosts and jack-o'-lanterns and goblins, and then we'd paint. It looked like the streets were loaded with little goblins and devils and demons and witches and Frankenstein and vampires. I mean, we really donned horrific looking costumes and played it up on Halloween. And not just that, but in the week before Halloween, my precious mother, who led me to Jesus and was a very committed Christian, would give me construction paper so that I could draw pictures of witches and ghosts and jack-o'-lanterns and goblins, and then we would paste them all over the big picture window in the front of our house. So we were really decorated for Halloween. Today, we would never do that. My mother would never condone that today. But back in those days, people really did not have an understanding that the devil was serious. And in fact, a lot of people thought the devil was funny. But is the devil funny? Really? Is he funny? And should Christians be celebrating Halloween, which is really a very sinister holiday, a very evil holiday? Is the devil funny? Well, today we're going to see. So reach for your Bible. And I want us to see what Jesus said about the devil in John chapter 10. So open your Bible to John chapter 10. And today we're going to begin in verse 10, where Jesus made this statement. He said, The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come, that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. This verse is just amazing. Jesus knew the devil better than anybody else. And in this verse, he calls the devil a thief. The devil is a thief. And in fact, the Greek word that is used here is the Greek word kleptes. Do you hear another word? It's where you get the word kleptomaniac. But the word thief that is used here, the Greek word kleptes, literally describes a bandit, a thief, a pickpocket, a scam artist, and it is where we get the term for a kleptomaniac. And by using this word kleptes, 
which is where we get the word kleptomaniac, Jesus tells us that the devil is a thief and he's been a thief from the very, very beginning. He can't help himself. There's something in his nature so twisted, so bent, that he just can't keep himself from stealing. In fact, the very first time we see the devil in the Bible, what is he doing? He's trying to steal the throne of God. He wants God's rightful place. And when you read about it in the Old Testament, he doesn't just want the throne of God. He wants God's geographical location. Not only that, he wants the worship of the angels. The very first time the devil appears in Scripture, he appears stealing, stealing, conniving like a scam artist. The next time he shows up is in the Garden of Eden, when through the serpent, he tries to steal Adam's position, Adam's position of authority over the earth, and he does it successfully. Again, he's stealing. He's a scam artist. He's after whatever belongs to someone else. In regard to you, he wants your health. Does he need your health? No. He's just a scam artist. He's a kleptomaniac. He can't restrain himself. If you have health, he wants your health. If you're married, guess what? He wants your marriage. Does he need your marriage? No. He just can't restrain himself because he is a kleptomaniac. He wants your marriage simply because he is a thief. How about your money? Does the devil need your money? No, he doesn't need your money. But he wants your money because he's a scam artist. He's a kleptomaniac. He cannot restrain himself. He is so twisted. He is so demented. He is so bent that he cannot restrain himself from stealing. It is his nature to steal. That is what Jesus says in this verse. It is just amazing. But wait. Then Jesus goes on to say the thief, from the Greek word kleptes, the kleptomaniac, the scam artist, the bandit, the pickpocket, cometh not but for to steal. Now Jesus adds. He uses the word steal, which is the Greek word klepto, which is in the same family as the word kleptes. It again describes one so artful in the way that he steals mm, that his exploits of thievery are nearly undetectable. A scam artist or a pickpocket. And again, it is where we get the word kleptomaniac. And in fact, the idea is this. The kleptomaniac, when he shows up, will begin to behave like a kleptomaniac. He can't restrain himself. He'll steal, steal, and steal because it is his nature to steal. He doesn't take because he needs anything. He takes simply because it is his nature to take and to steal. He is a kleptomaniac. That is what Jesus really says in this verse. The kleptomaniac, when he shows up, will begin to behave like a kleptomaniac. If you're healthy, he wants your health. If you're married, he wants your marriage. If you have money, he wants your marriage. If you have kids, he wants your kids. If you have grandkids, he wants your grandkids. What I want you to see, my friend, is there is nothing funny about the devil at all. He is a thief. And Jesus says when he shows up, the first thing he'll begin to do is to steal. But wait. Then Jesus goes on in John 10.10. 10, and he continues to say, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill. Well, for years when I read that word kill, I saw the picture of massacre, bloodshed, slaughter. I could just see the devil showing up and just slaying people. And then I got quite a shock when I opened my Greek New Testament and looked at this verse in the Greek text. This word kill really does not mean to kill at all. That's really not a good translation. It is the Greek word thuo. Now, anybody who knows Greek immediately recognizes the word thuo because the word thuo does not mean to kill as to murder, but actually it is the Greek word which means to sacrifice. To sacrifice. Hold on, I'm going to explain this to you. This word kill, the Greek word thuo, really means to sacrifice or to surrender or give up something that is precious and dear. Used among the Greeks, this word thuo described that moment when they would sacrifice something precious to the gods. And it was also used 
among the Greek speaking Jews to describe sacrifices they would make to God when they really surrendered something precious and something dear. And now Jesus uses that same word thuo in the context of this verse. Well, the first thing Jesus tells us is the devil is a thief. The thief cometh not but to steal. That word thief, again the Greek word klepto, it's the kleptomaniac, the one that is bent and so twisted that his nature is just to take and take and steal and steal, not because he needs, simply because he cannot restrain himself. He's just a thief. And Jesus says, the thief cometh not but to steal. The word klepto, when he shows up very artfully, he will begin to steal from people almost like a scam artist or like a pickpocket. He will very artfully begin to conduct thievery in the lives of people. And then Jesus says, and to kill from this word thuo, what does it mean? Jesus was teaching, here it is, this word thuo, which means to make a religious sacrifice, that the devil knows how to disguise his voice to sound religious. And sometimes he can even disguise his voice to sound like God. And here's what he says. You know what? There's no hope of recovery. There's no way you'll ever be able to restore what's been lost. Why try to believe? Just lay it all on the altar. Just walk away from it. Give it to God. Walk away from it. You might as well just give up, sacrifice it, and walk away. Or here we find... The devil knows how to religiously convince people that there is no hope and they ought to just surrender everything, give up, and walk away from any hope of recovery. This killer wants you to lay down your promises. He wants you to lay down your dreams. He wants you to lay down everything that remains in your life that he hasn't already stolen from you. He wants to convince you just to give it up. You say, well, can the devil really disguise his voice to sound like the voice of God? Well, you have to remember that even when Jesus was in his wilderness temptation, the devil quoted scripture to Jesus. But he quoted it out of context and Jesus recognized it was the voice of the devil trying to disguise himself to sound like scripture or to sound like God. And now in this verse, we remarkably find out that the devil comes to steal and to kill, the word kill, the word thuo, which means he can disguise his voice to sound like God, coaxing you into surrendering, giving up, and just walking away from everything you hold to be precious and dear. Just lay it on the altar. There's no hope of recovery. Just surrender it and walk away. That is amazing. But wait, Jesus then goes on to say that he comes to destroy. The word destroy in Greek is the word apolumi. It means to ruin, to waste, to devastate, or to destroy. It is the very same word that is used in Luke 3 verse 16 when John the Baptist said of Jesus, I'm not worthy to unloose his shoes. That word unloose is the same word here translated destroyed. So you have to think about how you unloose a person's shoes in the first century. Well, their feet were covered with sandals that were all strapped together with cords and ropes. And one rope at a time, you would begin to unloose it until finally the shoe became unraveled and it just fell off. Well, in the context of this verse, Jesus is saying here is the devil's intention. He wants to show up and steal from you. Then he wants to convince you to sacrifice everything that is left over, and he will not be satisfied until he takes it to the next level, and on the next level, he will continue attacking you until he has undone you completely, and you feel that your life has come unraveled. Unraveled. That is his intention, to unravel you, to undo you, until you feel your life is falling to pieces. That's literally what this word destroyed means. And I would translate John 10, 10 like this. Here's the RIV. This thief wants to get his hands into every good thing in your life. In fact, this pickpocket is looking for any opportunity 
to wiggle his way so deeply into your personal affairs that he can walk off with everything you hold precious and dear. And that's not all. When he's finished stealing all your goods and possessions, he'll take his plan to rob you blind to the next level by creating conditions and situations so horrible that you'll see no way to solve the problem except to sacrifice everything that remains from previous attacks. The goal of this thief is to totally devastate your life. If nothing stops him, he'll leave you insolvent, flat broke, cleaned out in every area of your life. You'll end up feeling as if you're finished and out of business. Make no mistake, the enemy's aim is to obliterate you. That is a marvelous RIV translation of John 10.10. 10. But hey, Jesus goes on in John 10.10. 10, and he says, but I am come, I am come, that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. When Jesus says, I am come, that, the word that is a Greek word, henna, which means I have come for this explicit purpose. Now Jesus is explicitly stating why he has come. I'm come that they might have, that they might have, is a form of the Greek word echo, which means to have, to hold, or to possess. Jesus says, I'm come that people might have, they might hold, they might really possess life. And the word life is a form of the Greek word zoe, which describes a life that is filled with vitality or a life that is filled with zest, a marvelous life, and that they might have it more abundantly. More abundantly in Greek is the word perisos, which describes something that is abundant, something excessive, something exceeding or extraordinary, something that abounds in an extraordinary measure, so profuse that it is likened to a river overflowing and flooding beyond its banks, something that is overflowing, plentiful, or even super abundant. And I would translate the second part of John 10, 10 like this. But I have specifically come with the express purpose that you will have, hold, and possess a phenomenal and amazing life. My purpose is that you will possess life so full that it overflows and spills over like a mighty river so full of water that its banks can no longer contain it all. I'm talking about an amazingly full, spirited, and vivacious life that is literally overflowing and spilling over. I have explicitly come so you can possess an abundant, profuse, plentiful, and bountiful life. That is what Jesus came to give. Is that amazing? But wait, I want to read all of John 10, 10 to you as a complete whole from the RIV. Listen to this. Jesus says, talking about the devil, who is not funny. Jesus says, this thief wants to get his hands into every good thing in your life. In fact, this pickpocket is looking for any opportunity to wiggle his way so deeply into your personal affairs that he can walk off with everything you hold precious and dear. And that's not all. When he's finished stealing all your goods and possessions, he'll take his plan to rob you blind to the next level by creating conditions and situations so horrible that you'll see no way to solve the problems except to sacrifice everything that remains from previous attacks. The goal of this thief is to totally devastate your life. If nothing stops him, he'll leave you insolvent, flat broke, cleaned out in every area of your life. You'll end up feeling as if you're finished and out of business. Make no mistake, the enemy's ultimate aim is to obliterate you. But I, I have specifically come with the express purpose that you will have, hold, and possess a phenomenal and amazing life. My purpose is that you will possess life so full that it overflows and spills over like a mighty river, so full of water that its banks can no longer contain it all. I'm talking about an amazingly full, spirited, and vivacious life that is literally overflowing and spilling over. I have explicitly come so you can possess an abundant, profuse, plentiful, and bountiful life. That is what Jesus came to give. Wow. And that's what you can have. But the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And there is nothing funny about the devil. And Christians should not be celebrating the devil on Halloween. 
But when we come back in the next program, I want to walk you into the New Testament and show you how New Testament Christians responded to pagan celebrations. Let me ask you, if the Apostle Paul was here today, what would he say about Christians who celebrate Halloween? That's what we're going to see in the next program. But today we have seen there's nothing funny about the devil. In fact, we're told in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 9, we are to resist him steadfast in the faith. But the devil's not fighting you over the things that you can see. He's fighting you over the things that you can't see. He wants your mind. He wants your attitude. He wants your heart. So that's what he's fighting you over, your attitude. Glory to God. But Jesus, hallelujah. And the wonderful thing is that Jesus came and exposed the truth of our enemy. And then he didn't just leave it there, but he gave us the power over him, right? Luke 10, 19, for I have given you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, that nothing shall by any means harm you. Glory to God. Then also, Scripture also tells us, for this reason was the Son of God made manifest to destroy, dissolve, do away with, the works of the devil. Glory to God. So how much greater, glory to God, is the power on our side? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Glory to God. I'll close us in prayer. Father, we are so grateful. Thank you, Father, that at the point of man's greatest failure, Father, you did not choose to replace man. You chose to redeem man. So, Father, I thank you for the plan of redemption through Jesus. Thank you for giving us Jesus. And I pray tonight, Father, that we would leave here with a greater revelation of the height, the length, the depth, and the breadth of your great love for us, Lord. And Father, I pray over every circumstance in this room, Lord, <laughs> those who identified with what the thief has been trying to do in their life, to the point of making them feel like their life is just falling apart, disheveled. Well, Lord, I thank you that you came and you sent Jesus to put all the pieces back together. You said that you would give us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And so, Lord... <laughs> We just cast the care of whatever those things are. We cast them over onto you because you care for us. And as we do that, Lord, we thank you that you are faithful and you perfect those things that have been concerning us. And Lord, areas where we have been perpetually anxious Lord, we resolve within ourselves tonight to lay it at this altar and not pick it back up. But we make the choice to seek you first. And you said when we do that, all these things that we've been anxious and fretting and worried about, Lord, would be added to us. And so, Father, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Glory to God. Um, so am I supposed to say anything about that or no? No, okay. Um, so fellowship. <laughs> so we were going to do something else, but we're going to um, just, if you guys are welcome to fellowship, Miss Patricia has all kinds of great things out there for us. Um,
Miss Linda and I will be up here for prayer. Um, and I don't know if we have the, I think we have the date for the next meeting, but that'll come out in the announcements or whatever. But I'm also, um, pretty soon we'll start, to, Shana will start to announce about the ladies event too and start to have like a sign up um, and things like that for, for the ladies e uh, event. Um, and um, I, if I haven't shared with you, I think I shared with you the theme restored that the Lord gave me restored. Hallelujah. So that's going to be the theme of this um, next women's event is restored. Glory to God. I love you, ladies. You're so precious. And I'm, thank you. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful you're here. Glory to God. And God is doing good things. He's doing good things. And we're going to see some, I believe, signs, miracles, and wonders. We're going to follow the word preached here. We're, we're going to start to see miracles in a greater level. I, I truly believe that because um, Jesus is coming soon and um, the glory of the Lord is going to fill this earth. Glory to God. And we get to be part of that. Praise God. Hallelujah. So thank you for your, your hunger for the word and pressing in um, because it's important. It says all the more as we see that day approaching. We should be every 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 chance we get praise god to be being filled up with the word glory to god and in his presence right not like the five virgins who were slacking right <laughs> glory to god see you ladies next time <laughs> praise god.